good to be here with everybody today. And uh, Brother Terry said we had to give a proper hug because earlier we each had a baby on the arm and all we could do was sort of a pat the shoulder thing. But uh, that was an official hug there. And uh, I've uh, since I've been here, I've been here, what is this, my third time, I think. And, and I tell you, I, I feel like I'm coming, I'm coming home to dear friends and more important than that, members of the body of Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm glad to be here, and uh, we've had a great time being down here, and I think we've gotten more fun stuff with the kids in done this time than we have the previous times we've been down here. And uh, another thing, too, the, the brother back there with the camera, he come, he got out of his car, and he said, I'm going to be filming you. I hope that's okay. And, and I said, if you think your camera can handle it, and he said, whoa, there must be some good preaching. That, that's not what I meant at all. <laughs> I meant if this camera can handle this mug right here. But uh, words, you know, have power. They can be misunderstood. They can be misused. They can be, they can be used for ill purposes. There are certain words we should never, as Christians, say at all. And uh, that's kind of an interesting way to enter into what I was wanting to talk about anyhow. And uh, the side of my notes are wet because we went to the beach before we came here and we, we were getting the kids out of their wet clothes and into the church clothes and stuff and and my wife threw Will's wet clothes right on top of my Bible, so <laughs> I got some pages wet and stuff like that. But I do hope you all be praying for me, because whether a Bible's moist or dry, it's the Word of God. And if God will bless me, I hope that um, I'll be able to say something that would be edifying and encouraging to everybody here today. Once again, I thank you all for the opportunity to be here, and just really appreciate Brother JC and everybody here. Um, if you would, go with me to Matthew 5, and we're going to start in 33, Matthew 5 and 33, and this, of course, is what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, or as I like to call it, Kingdom Living 101, because there's stuff in here about how we are to live as Christians and how we can live the triumphant Christian life all in here, and I, I've read in commentaries and things where where. Some people say that this was actually for Jews and this wasn't for Christians. Well, that's nonsense. There's stuff in here about divorce, adultery. There's stuff about murder, love, all the things that affect us in our lives as Christians. It's all in here. This is to the church as well as the Jews that Jesus was originally addressing. And um, if you read in 5 and 33, Jesus says, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time." Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Now what it meant to forswear yourself was to swear falsely, was to bear false witness in a swear before God. And, um, and it says, Jesus says in old time, he means in the law, in the, in the Bible that these Jews knew that to forswear or to make a false vow was wrong. But... The concept of swearing and law, Old Testament law prescribed swearing, is actually a legitimate biblical thing in the Old Testament. And I want to show you, um, there are Old Testament examples of law prescribed swearing of oaths. Now, y'all know that in that part of the world back then, an ox or some kind of an animal like that was a valuable thing. Like, we live up in Georgia, around the Savannah area, Statesboro area, and there's a lot of agriculture in the Statesboro area. Those tractors and combines and stuff that my little boy loves so much <laughs> that are all around where we live, those things are valuable things. Well, back in this day, or back in Jesus' day, and also back in the Old Testament you know, times of Moses, an animal was an incredibly valuable thing. I mean, you, you would get wool from the sheep. You would get work out of oxes. You would get meat that you would feed your family with these animals. I mean, there's a lot of good things that came from animals. So when somebody would loan somebody an animal, the, uh, the, the person that borrowed the animal was was expected to take good care of it well sometimes somebody would steal the animal the animal would get wounded or killed by by some wild beast or whatever there was things that would happen to animals that were being borrowed by somebody and there is a prescribed oath over here that was to be sworn before the lord um, if somebody was borrowing somebody's ox or sheep or whatever it was and something happened to it while the person that was borrowing it was away when the person that had loaned it to them found out about it or came to reclaim it, the person that had borrowed it would say, hey, I, I'm serious, I hate that it happened, but I don't know what happened to the animal. You know, it's wounded or it's missing or whatever. And in Exodus 22 and 11, it says, in this situation, it says, 
Then shall an oath of the Lord be between them both, the, the two people, the one that borrowed it and the one who was the lender, um, that he hath not, that's the one who borrowed it, that he hath not put his hand unto his neighbor's goods. And the owner of it, the one that had borrowed it, the one that actually owned the animal, the owner of it shall accept thereof, and he shall not make it good, meaning that the one that had borrowed it doesn't have to make it good because it was an honest mistake. It wasn't an intended thing. Okay, well, it says right there, an oath of the Lord would be between them. So right there, you have an Old Testament prescription for swearing oaths before God. And what it was was in that Old Testament time period, as well as in our own nation at one time, there was a strong fear of God among the people. This was a, a divine or an oath before God that was to bring fear of divine punishment, which keeps people honest. Honestly, the fear of God keeps us honest. It says in the Bible, the fear of God is the beginning of what? Wisdom, right? The beginning of knowledge. If there's not a fear of God in the nation, unfortunately, like our nation is getting to be, you have all kind of wickedness in your land. Because people don't fear God Almighty anymore like they used to. And of course, you know that that pretty much the, the, the Jews always had a degree of rebellion in them. But there, there was a time back then where they were serving God a little better than they later fell away more and more and more and more. Our nation, when our nation was founded, do you know that one of our founding fathers, arguably the most Christian and religious of them, John Adams, our second president, actually said about our founding, about our Constitution and the Bill of Rights, he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said that the um, founding documents and the founding government of our nation are for a godly, moral, and God-fearing people, a religious people. And, it, and he said, our way of government is wholly inadequate for anybody else. You see, that's why our society's breaking down around us. Because our society back then was based on a God-fearing people. Did you know that back then you couldn't serve in the Congress without believing not in a God, but in God Jehovah and Jesus Christ? It was expected back then that people would, even if they were atheists, would act Christian. That was expected. How far have we fallen from those days? Very far. Well, John Adams said that our Constitution and our founding documents would not, would not work for anybody else. What the founders knew was that government, <clears throat> the thing that keeps government in line is us. That's why we have a Second Amendment. The government's to fear the people and to serve the people. God even prescribes that way in Romans 13. It's to be God's servant. <clears throat> and what keeps us in line is the fear of God. When you've got a people who don't fear God, then those people have no power, and thus the government is not going to be kept in line, and the government will become tyrannical, and that's what we're having happen right now. <clears throat> and that's why these oaths existed back then was the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of civil government and the beginning of a peaceful nation is the fear of God. Jesus says in verse 33, I'll read it again. Again, ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, make false vows, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. And then Jesus says, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. So Jesus comes on the scene and says, you know, back in the Old Testament, the law says that there are certain times that you are to swear oaths. But I'm here to tell you, don't swear oaths at all. He says, but I say, swear not at all. <laughs> who can come on the scene and nullify the word of God? I heard the right answer. I, I didn't think about this until I was studying this out, but you know how it says in the Bible that the people were saying, and it made the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the Jews, the scribes, the teachers of the law, it made them so mad because people were saying, this Jesus, he's teaching us like one who has authority, not like the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, and they hated that. Well, what made Jesus sound different? Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those teachers of the law, they would take a, a portion of Old Testament scripture and they would say, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. What we think that means is, and then they would go into giving a, a commentary type of an explanation. Jesus comes on the scene and say for that particular one, thou shalt not kill. Jesus said, but I say that if you have anger towards someone, you have already committed murder in your heart. 
Do you realize what Jesus just did? He took it way to another level. He took it way out of the letter of the law and into a matter of the heart. And what he's doing right here, it says, it says back then, you know, there's a certain way you swear oaths. And if you don't, you know, if you're, you, you better be careful to, to fearfully in the fear of God perform your oaths. Jesus says, I say, don't swear at all. He didn't just tweak it or like in that other place where he says, um, you know, thou shalt not kill. But I say, if you have anger, then you've, you've uh, killed already. That's showing what the heart of the law always was. What he's saying here is he's nullifying part of the word of God. And if I wrote a book, I could re-release that book later with a different ending. Why? Because I'm the author. This Bible has things in it. The only way somebody can tweak, change, or nullify any of it is that they themselves are God. You might want to show that to any Jehovah's Witness friends you have sometime because there's a lot of places in the Bible where you can prove the deity of Jesus Christ. The fact that he was able to set aside the word of God and say, I, God, am telling you something new. There's a new kingdom age. I, Jesus, am your Messiah, and I am able to change, tweak, and even set aside that Old Testament stuff because you've got a better and more glorious salvation. That's the Savior that we serve. And that's what Jesus is doing here. I bet you could just feel the authority just thundering from the lips of Jesus right there. Let's read verse 34 again. After he said, you know, the law says you just swear this way, Jesus says, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it's his footstool, and neither by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou, that shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white, or one hair black. And what he's saying there is, and it's kind of weird, I can't even imagine how you would swear by your head. But apparently in that day, in that culture, somebody would say, you know, let me borrow $10 and I swear by my head I'll pay you back. You know, that sounds odd to us, but apparently they did that. And it really, I think what it was getting at was they were pretty much calling a curse on themselves if they didn't perform whatever it was, saying, by my very head, <laughs> you know, this will be performed. I will do this. I think that's what the, the deal was. But Jesus goes on and he says, you don't have authority over your own life. You don't have even authority over your aging process. You can't take that gray hair and make it black or that black hair and make it gray. You don't have that kind of authority. And we do have Grecian formula now. I understand that. But that's not what he's talking about. We can't control the aging process. That's all in God's hands. Everything like that is in God's hands. And he's, and I mean, believe me, if I could will it, I would change some of these colors. And I'd probably keep this sticking to my head a little better than it is because it's turning loose the older I get. But um, <laughs> when we swear, and, and heaven, we don't have any right to claim the authority of heaven because that's God's throne. And the earth, we don't have any right to claim the power and the authority that earth brings because that's God's footstool. And the city of the great king, we can't swear by civil government because we don't have power over civil government. If we did, there'd be different people in office right now. But we don't. God is in, is in control of the affairs of men. And we have to just submit to his power. You see, what he's saying is when we swear, we're acting as humans as if we have some control. And we don't have control. God has control. It's human nature, though, to try to manipulate and control circumstances and people. We all tend, tend to try that. We all want to do that. It happened, it, 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 if you'll turn over to Isaiah real quick, in um, the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, we read about a king of Babylon, and uh, also... Through the, through the proverb against this king of Babylon, I think we also see a picture of Satan here. But um, <clears throat> if you'll turn to Isaiah 14, and um, in verse 4, this lets you know who Isaiah is getting this message for, initially. You know, prophecy oftentimes has several facets of fulfillment, and, and, and it's oftentimes various things are being viewed in it, like uh, in Jesus' Olivet Discourse, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was in view, but also, I think, in that discourse, the end of the world is also in view. So there's several fulfillments oftentimes to prophecies and several meanings in prophecies. And if you look at Isaiah 14, we read um, in uh, 14 and 4 that thou shalt take up this proverb, talking to Isaiah, God talking to Isaiah, shall take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how, how hath the oppressor ceased the golden city ceased. He's talking about a king of Babylon, and of course, this was before Nebuchadnezzar and the, and the rise of Babylon to its, 
to its glory days that it was in, in the days of Daniel, which would be another couple of hundred years from now. Um, so we know that initially this proverb was to be taken up against the king of Babylon. But we also see some language that sounds very similar to uh, somebody else being described here. Over in Isaiah 14 and 13, uh, 14 and 12 rather, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And that means day star or luminescent one. Um, how art thou cut down from the ground which did weaken, which didst weaken the nations? And here's the part right here. The same way Jesus was saying that we're not to, that we're not to, to, to take vows and to try to, try to claim authority we don't have. Listen at what both the king of Babylon, figuratively speaking here, and also I believe Satan is saying. It says, for thou hast said in thine heart, now this is a vow, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. What pompous attitude. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, I believe initially this was looking at the future king of Babylon, who we know Nebuchadnezzar did lift himself up and make claims of grandeur, and even claims of deity when he made that giant sculpture that everybody was supposed to worship, most commentators believe that was probably an image of Nebuchadnezzar himself. So he certainly was wanting to be worshipped, he was puffed up, he was wanting to push the true God out of the scene and be God. So it definitely fits Nebuchadnezzar. But I think there's a reason why we all see Lucifer and think of it as the devil, because I do think there's a picture of Lucifer here as well, and how he puffed up, and how God cast him down. But listen what Lucifer's ultimate end will be in 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And we're all destined for destruction when we start puffing up and trying to assume on ourselves authority that we don't have. As Christians, we're supposed to submit to God and live a humble life. James talks about this same sort of boasting over in the book of James. In James 4 and 13, James says, Go to now. That means come now. Ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a city or into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. You see right there, James is telling about somebody who's got a lot of belief in his own abilities. He says that we're going to go into a city, we're going to continue there a year, um, buy and sell and make a profit. This is a person who's, who's claiming that he's going to be able to do things that are in God's hands. We don't have the power to live or go one place or another or, or make a profit or anything without God's blessing. Anybody that builds, you know, what is it? The watchman watch in vain if the house has not been founded by God. And that's a paraphrase, but that's the idea. <clears throat> and also in the book of Proverbs, if you'll turn over to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3 and verse 5, we're not to lean on our own selves and our own strength, but this tells you what we are to lean on. In Proverbs 3 and 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all, not some, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's the kind of confidence I want to have when I go out and face this world that my God loves me and who loved me and lifted me up out of the mire of my sin and set my feet on firm ground, the ground of Jesus Christ and him crucified. He was made sin for me. I believe that with every fiber. I wouldn't be here right now if I didn't. He was made sin for me who knew no sin that I have been made the very righteousness of God. I have been blessed so much more than I deserve. I have been blessed to get down here safely with my, I think, beautiful family, and we have, enjoyed, we have enjoyed a good time, but never once did I think to myself, we're going to go to Florida, and we're going to go see stuff, and we're going to go eat at a restaurant, and we're going to... I didn't think that at all. Before we left, I prayed. I said, God, please bless us to go down, have a good time, good time of fellowship with those people down there. Help us to get home. Lord, you are in control. That's the kind of prayer that we need to be praying every time. We don't need to be coming at God, or, or actually this man in James is not coming at God at all. He's just saying what he's going to do. He doesn't seem to be even interested in God. It says, you know, after he says that we're going to go into this city and, and buy and sell and make a profit, verse 14, he says, James says, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor 
that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. He says, for that ye ought to say, or what you ought to say is, if the Lord is willing or if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. He goes on and says, but now ye rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. There's nothing God finds more repugnant in this whole world than a haughty look, a proud look, and a proud attitude. He despises that. And that's exactly what Jesus is addressing over here when he says, don't take all this authority that you don't have on yourself. He, listen, after he says, don't swear by any of these things, by your head, by any of this, in verse 37, he says, he says, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. That's basically what James just said. If you go around claiming the authority of things, you know, I've heard people, you know, claiming the authority, I swear to God, I'll pay you back for that. I hear stuff like that. It's like, look, man, don't swear to God. I'll just give you the money, okay? Just here, have it, you know? I don't want to hear that kind of stuff. Or I swear by my mama's grave. If somebody's trying to add credibility, add capital to their existence by saying stuff like that, there's something wrong to begin with. If a person is is of good moral integrity and good moral character, they can just come up and say, hey, I need some money. Um, I will pay you back as soon as I can, I promise. Well, see, see, I even tend to say it, see? (laughs) But, you know, a promise is not exactly the same thing, I guess, as a vow. But the thing is, if the person knows your character, that person will know that you're good for it. And you don't have to add all these uh, flowers to what you're saying to make it better. Dependence on God is our only hope in this life. I know I don't have any hope but Christ. And Christ tells us how we're to live and how we're to speak. And, And nay, nay, yay, yay, that just means let your yes be yes and your no, let your no be no. Because anything else comes from evil. And what we're really to be and what this is all pointing to is that as Christians, we're supposed to be honest, straight-talking, humble people that can be trusted. We've We've been given the Spirit of God, and this kind of personality, this kind of reputation is attainable to us if we will only let Christ live through us and be who he wants to be through us. It's the flesh that gets in the way. That's why Paul says we need to crucify that thing daily so that Jesus can more freely be seen in us. I mean, if you'll, if you'll go over to um, Ephesians 5 and 8. <clears throat> in Ephesians, actually, we're going to... Yeah, 5 and 8. <clears throat> it says, It says, For ye were sometimes darkness, in Ephesians 5 and 8, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now, like I said, God's Spirit in us gives us the ability to be good people. That's why His Spirit is in us. He wants us. We're His workmanship. He wants us to be representing ourselves as Christians should, morally, decently, among the people we encounter. But on the other side of that, the the Arminians out there will tell you that as soon as you're born again, you're sanctified like that, and that's not true. Sanctification is a process. If you look at this again, he says, you were sometimes darkness, or you were once darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord If we were instantly sanctified as soon as we're born again, why would he have to say, now walk as children of light? If we were instantly sanctified in a split second, when as soon as we're regenerated, we were sanctified, we would be walking as children of light, right? But we still have that flesh. We have that battle going on. We have to continue to keep... I heard uh, Brother Mark at at my church, uh, he's a deacon who speaks sometimes, and he was talking about how it's like a beach ball. You keep it under the water, and you can do it, but it's something you got to keep thinking about. You can't just say, okay, stay and go do something else. That thing's coming right back up. The spirit of man will come up every time it gets a chance. By God's power, we got to keep that thing subjugated so we can live for Jesus like we ought to. And so people can see who we are in Christ wherever we go. We need to be a light wherever we're going. And I heard somebody, actually a preacher a long time ago say, we can't be sinless, but we can sin less. And I think there's a lot of, of wisdom in that. I also want to talk real quick about 
Well, let's look at, let's look at chapter five now real quick. He says, or no, rather four. Ephesians four and, uh, and 31. And I eventually want to get to talking about another kind of speech, which is also called swearing. But in our current vernacular, it doesn't just mean making a vow. It means something else. But there's a reason why I think that that same word swearing is used for modern profanity as well. And I want to get to that in just a second. In uh, Ephesians 4 and 31, Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, that re that's referring to gossip, profanity, and things that hurt people, be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now there, there is so much in that I almost don't even know where to start. But one place I'd like to start is sort of a, sort of a side to, to, to this. That part where it says, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There, there was a time in my life. I mentioned Arminians earlier. I grew up an Arminian. I grew up in, in a, in a Pentecostal Church of God church. And, and, and I, I was made by some fire and brimstone sermons to fear God, but it didn't have any lasting value for me. And every Sunday I was praying, asking God, oh, save me. You know, don't let me go to hell. Save me. But then I'd go on my way and it didn't change my heart. It didn't really change me. Um, <clears throat> So after I came to love the doctrines of grace, you know, whatever you were brought up in, there's going to be vestiges of that in you. And, and it's hard to get rid of some of that. And a lot of that, I mean, there are good godly people among Pentecostals. My grandparents are some of the best people I know. But there is a bondage to legalism there that's awful. And, and, and I eventually, as I became a teenager and all those hormones started kicking in and stuff, I realized I ain't keeping this. It's not working. I'm not holding the line. And, and, if, and if it's really true that if I sin, I'm lost again until I get saved again, I'm probably going to end up on the wrong side of that equation and go to hell. And it was a despairing thing. It didn't leave me any hope. But when I learned about the doctrines of grace, I was made to rejoice because I saw a Savior who before the foundation of the world loved me. I wasn't making my way to him. He loved me and he reached down where I was and pulled me out of all that mess. When I was living in sin and going to parties and doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing, even up into my 20s, I'd be going to a party where I knew things that I shouldn't be doing was going on there, and I'd be digging on the low end of the FM dial trying to find preaching. And I felt like I was going crazy. And what was really happening was my Jesus wasn't leaving me in that mire. He says, you're mine and I'm bringing you home. I didn't know I had a Savior like that. And I didn't fully know it really until I met Jennifer and her family and the Godwins. I did come to believe that you couldn't lose your salvation like the, like all the Baptists pretty much do, that once you get yourself saved, then you can't lose it. But then I got to talking to them and I got to seeing a more sovereign God than I ever knew we had. I got to seeing a Christ who came down from his place on high, came down into this mud pen that we call the world, lived a perfect life, and died a perfect lamb to redeem me and to redeem you from our sins. Man, you talk about something. Oh, that was what I needed. And I have learned and, and rejoiced in it ever since. But like I said, no matter what, <laughs> for, for a long time, it's hard to break down those old strongholds and to, I knew that it was of grace. I knew it was from before the foundation of the world. But in my heart, I believe I still had this thing in there that was saying, you're saved by grace, you're a wretched sinner, but Jesus saved you. But you're really not as bad as that guy. And you know, your heart's a little better than that heart. And you would never think thoughts like that, much less do them. And I had those things because we all, and you know what, you got to be honest. It's natural to humans to have those things in your heart. You see somebody, you know, somewhere you go and they're covered in tattoos and piercings and stuff. And you're like, I sure am glad I'm better than that. And then, and then you have to reconcile yourself and say, that was a sinful thought. I'm, that was pride. Well, I still had a stronghold of pride in me. And then all of a sudden, one night when I was at work, it happened. I, I, I won't say what the, it was a wicked thought that came into my mind. And, 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 and I just thought suddenly that last stronghold that, well, I'm, I'm towing the line, at least in my heart, my mind, I'm keeping it. I realized I'm not keeping it. I am a wretch through and through. 
And I honestly believe, you read in some of those old primitive Baptist books like Wilson Thompson and stuff, I believe this was the beginning of my real experience of grace. Because I went through a time where I was mourning, I was in darkness, I felt like there was no light. I felt like, have y'all ever read Wilson Thompson's autobiography? There's a place in there where he actually, in the middle of preaching, and revival is happening, and God is bringing in so many people. And right in the middle of that, Satan whispers something into his mind, and he begins to believe that he's not really a child of God, but that he's just a tool that God's been using like a shepherd's staff to bring in the sheep. And as soon as he's done with him, he's casting him away. And he got that oppression on him, and right in the middle of a great revival that God was pouring out, he quit preaching. I mean, the devil can get you in a dark place. And he had me in a dark place. And the more you try not to think wicked things, that's when you start thinking wicked things. And it got to be a cyclical thing. And I didn't know what I was going to do. But you know what I did know? I knew that if I don't have hope in this, I don't have hope at all. And so I kept on praying. I kept on reading my Bible. And I believed that God was going to bring me out of it. But it was a long time. And you can ask my wife. She used to, she used to didn't know what to do with me. I'd be like, oh, woe is me, woe is me. She's like, you just need to get over it and stop worrying about it. You know, and she, I mean, she would try to get, and that's just like, you know, lovingly. But still, she was like, you, if you dwell on it all the time, you're never going to get better. But anyway, in the midst of the mire, in the midst of thinking that my sins have forever, my, my sinful heart now, not just the acts outwardly, but my sinful heart was separating me from God. And I didn't know what to do. And I couldn't feel that peace and joy that I had once felt anymore. I read the Bible. I said, I've got to read. And I read this. And you got to think that a man thinking that he's towing the line or had been towing the line reads this. There's freedom in the word of God, y'all. There's liberty in the word of God. It says, and be ye kind, 32 again, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you hath forgiven you. That's a past tense word, but it even gets better than that. God was like saying, read it again and tell me where Dave's good little boy works and deeds and the name Dave at all are in there. And I read it again and it says that we are to be to others kind, we're to be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And I tell you, the tears started to flow and I stood up and I put that down and I went in and I told my wife, I said, I have seen my Jesus and I have seen my salvation. I don't know if I said exactly those words, but that's what I'm feeling right now because that is the truth. There is not your name and there's not my name in there. There's only God the Father and Jesus Christ right there. And if it was done before the foundation of the world, how could we start it and how could we possibly mess that up? And liberty came that day. And I've not been in that same dark place again. Oh, I have anxiety, dark times, depressed times. We all go through the valleys, don't we? I mean, that's just part of life. And it will continue to be as long as we're here. When these eyes close in death and they open in glory, it won't be that way anymore. But right now, that's how it is. But praise God, when you've got foundational bedrock things like that in the Word of God you can stand on, you can, <laughs> you know, I've heard people say, I felt like I could take on hell with a, with a water pistol. That's how I felt that day. And that's how I'm kind of feeling right now. Um, <clears throat> but that's, that was a little tangent, but I wanted to say that there because that portion of Scripture has been one of the most pivotal portions of Scripture to my Christian life of any of them. I love that, I love the whole epistle of Ephesians, but that right there, what was just the linchpin for my for my understanding what my God has done for me. And go on down, it says, a therefore, we're going to look at what the therefore is there for. It says, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now what that means, followers of God, that means imitators of God. As dear or dearly loved children. In verse 2 it says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But he's saying right there in verse 1, he's saying, imitate your father. He says, be, uh, be a follower, be an imitator of God as dear or dearly loved children. And, and, you know, right after I was preparing, you know, God teaches us things while we're studying his word. And in the time frame when you're reading it, you'll see little things in nature and in your life that'll drive certain portions of the scriptures home to your heart. And before I came down here, my car 
was absolutely dusty and filthy and, I mean, just covered with dust. And I'm just thinking, because my work car, you know, I'm thinking, you know, we, we can't go down there with this filthy car. And my little boy, um, I, I went out, got my mop bucket, got my mop. He went and got his mama's mop and came out there. And I'm out there trying to wash. And he goes out and starts dipping his mama's mop in there and starts washing the car with me. Because he loves me. He knows I love him. And he was trying to imitate daddy. And I'm telling you, if you know that your heavenly father has loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that you might live forever with him in glory, how much more ought we to be imitating that father? Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. He's saying, forgive as you've been forgiven. That's what he's saying there. He's saying, forgive as you've been forgiven. And how is that? Freely and undeservedly. Don't sit back and say, well, that person doesn't look like they deserve to be forgiven, or that person doesn't look like they need pity, or that person doesn't look like they deserve. It doesn't matter. You didn't either. I didn't either. But I received it abundantly from my Savior. And I've got to live as though I received it abundantly from my Savior. But on back to the original purpose I was here for, verse 3, it says, But fornication, that's sexual sin of all kinds, and all uncleanness or covetousness, he says, let it not once be named among you as becometh saints. Don't even, don't even have it in your conversation. Don't even let these wicked things be named among you. In verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking and filthiness that's referring in a, a filthiness is referring to obscenity nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient but rather giving thanks and the modern vernacular swearing that I was talking about earlier is not vowing oaths but it's still called swearing and i believe that the reason why profanity and cursing and cussing is called swearing, is because have you ever noticed it typically has to do when somebody, not always, sometimes it's in jesting, which is also not a good thing, foolish jesting and hurtful talk, but it's oftentimes when somebody's angry that the profanities just come forth. And when somebody's angry with somebody else, what are they trying to do? They're trying to control the conversation, they're trying to control the situation, and they're trying to dominate somebody. And what does a profanity do? As awful and vile as it is, it will get your attention. And that's what they're wanting to do. They're wanting to bring more authority to their speech by throwing these filthy words in here. And Paul's saying that we don't need that kind of stuff. Like Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. All the rest of that stuff comes from evil. And we need to be remembering that filthiness and foolish talking and all this, it's not convenient. That convenient means it's not fitting of saints. And you know... I know this is St. Andrew's Primitive Baptist Church, but we're not a Catholic church. And so we don't have to wait until we get lifted up by the church to be saints. By Jesus Christ's blood being applied to you, you are a saint. And we need to be behaving ourselves like saints in the kingdom of God. We need to put away filthiness. We need to put away foolish talking, jesting. And that jesting, that gets me because at work, <clears throat> I'm like the king of foolishness. I'm always cutting up and joking. And I don't think he's saying don't have fun. Nobody thinks that Christians are supposed to be prudes all the time, but we don't need to be joking at other people's expense. We don't need to be hurting people. We don't need to be mocking things that we ought not be mocking. We don't need to be ever using filthy language. There's a certain level of decency that we as Christians need to live up to, and we need to be living up to it every day. Clamoring after worldly power and control, which I really believe profanity is a facet of, won't make us thankful. He says right there that um, that filthiness and foolish talking and jesting and all that is not convenient, it's not fitting, but rather giving thanks. If you're always living your life trying to serve you and trying to gain in any way you can power and influence and climb the ladder and keeping up with the Joneses and that's all you ever think about, then you've basically made yourself a little god. That's what the human flesh wants to do. Just like Satan over there. I'll lift up and I'll be... He was an angel or, or some created being. But he wanted to lift up above God. He was puffing up. And that's what we do with our words, with our over 
you know, overzealous uh, swearing or our profanities or whatever, we're lifting ourselves up and we're clamoring to gain power out here when we've already been given by our rich father everything that heaven has. We can live in that right now. That's real riches. That's where the joy is. That's where the peace is. And it's not going to make us, as Paul says, we're supposed to be thankful. It's not going to make us thankful because if we're worshiping basically me, if I'm worshiping Dave and trying to please Dave and trying to get everybody's attention for Dave... You know what's just happened? When I fail, I'll become bitter. And when I succeed, I'll become proud. Where's thankfulness to God in either of those two eventualities? They're not there. That's why we need to be humble. We need to be loving people. And we need to speak that which is edifying, as Paul says in another place. We need to try to lift others up and esteem them greater than ourselves. And we need to be separate. We need to remain separate from the world. And we need to be at the same time being examples to it. Christianity is the basic root of what made America great. This nation was founded on godly principles, and we're at, we drift away from that to our own destruction. And you know, I'm not trying to scare anybody. That's just a fact. What we need to be doing is esteeming others higher than ourselves. If you'll turn with me back to Matthew... <clears throat> after Jesus tells us the kind of communication we're not to have and the kind of communication we are to have, he goes on down after this, and I think this fits in perfectly with the swearing and cursing and profanity thing. He's going to talk now about vengeance and and how we should look towards trying to deal with other people when they do things wrong to us. We want vengeance. We naturally desire vengeance. To, to have you know wrongs righted in our own power when we've been when we feel that we've been wrong. But we need to let God do all that. He says um in, in verse thirty eight, once again that same formula, ye have heard that it hath been said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. And of course you know the full thing was bruise for bruise, wound for wound. Basically whatever is done to you, that should be done to the person who did it. <clears throat> And, of course, by Jesus' day, there were courtroom settlements that were taking the place of some of this, actually most of this. By Jesus' day, if somebody broke your tooth or hurt you or whatever, you could go in and get a cash settlement for it. But Jesus says, you've heard, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. He goes, but I say unto you that ye not resist evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And and I've got to admit, this portion of scripture is not a flesh feeding exciting in that way thing it'll feed your spirit but it's hard on the flesh who in the world says when somebody does something mean to me i'm supposed to turn and let them do more that's what jesus says and truthfully this had more to do it didn't have to do with sitting and letting yourself be beat into a bloody pulp it had to do with honor and dishonor and this society really held up honor and to be smitten on, on the right cheek was, was just a complete act of, of utter contempt for another person. And you would just be like, ooh, you know, you'd be so mad. You know, I've even heard preachers say, all right, you hit me on the right, now here's the left. Okay, and to start taking her jacket off, it's on now. That's not the mentality that's being taught here. The mentality that's being taught here is we are in all cases to love and esteem other people greater than ourselves, and that needs to be our bedrock mentality. <clears throat> If you look down in 40, he says, And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now somebody wants to sue you and take something from you, and you're to give them more than they're trying for legally. And truthfully, that coat was a tunic that was worn close to the skin. It was an undergarment. And this person, for whatever reason, is trying to sue this man um, at court to get this coat Now, the outer garment, it was actually illegal in Old Testament law to take that coat, that cloak, rather, the outer garment. Because a person that didn't have that, if they were ever in a spot where they needed to stay outside, which happened sometimes, or at night when it would get cold, that outer garment could be like a blanket to keep somebody warm. The Old Testament actually says not to to allow that. It was actually illegal to take that coat. So... That outer garment, the the inner garment, he says, if they want to take that inner garment, don't only give them that, but give them that outer garment too. Even though it's your right to have it, give it to them. And what he's saying is be willing to give up your rights 
for other people. Now, if you, if you teach somebody about their rights, and you start telling a society about their rights, you might end up with a revolution. If you start telling people to submit to other people and love them and suppress, suppress your wickedness and love unreservedly, you might have a revival on your hands. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. He's teaching we don't need to be fighting and striving for our rights. I heard a preacher one time say, as soon as you step as soon as you step into the demanding your rights room, you've stepped out of the love room because you're striving for what you can get. And that's not the mentality that Jesus is talking about here. In 41, it says, Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, or two, to go two miles. If somebody's trying to compel you to go one mile, go two. And this pertained to the occupation of Judea by the Romans. The Jews were forced by law that if a Roman soldier wanted the Jews to carry his stuff. The Jews, and I'm telling you, the Jews did not like being under the thumb of Rome. There was a lot of zealots, and they were always wanting to rise up and, 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 and take back the, the kingdom, and they were hoping for that Messiah that would not be dying on a cross, but would be crowned king and would be reestablished in Jerusalem like in the days of David, and they would be subduing the world and subduing the Romans. That's what they viewed as the coming Messiah, and that's what they were wanting. They hated Rome. They hated that Rome had power over them and, as I said, had its thumb on them. They despised it. And Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jews, probably some zealots right there, and saying, if a Roman wants you to do this, Go two miles with them. How revolutionary is that? That that gets all over my flesh. But my Jesus didn't just say it. He lived it. You see, it's one thing for somebody to stand up like I'm doing right now who has lots of sins and tell you about how you ought to live. But I'm telling you, this is the red writing. This is a man who said, consider yourself lower than others, and then he lived it and died on a cross for us. That mentality right there is enough to get us rethinking when we start to get mad in traffic or start to you know, hit our thumb with a, <laughs> with a hammer and start to say those words we ought not say. If we will wake up every day and say, Lord, I know I'm far from perfect, but thank you, Jesus, I got another day, another chance to serve you. I got another chance to not fail you, God. And if we, if we just despise our sin and hope to serve Jesus with everything we have and know that his Holy Spirit did not come into us to just hide like a rabbit hopping into a log. His Holy Spirit makes us alive. It changes us. And what did Paul say? Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Before we're born again, we're a slave to sin. That's what Paul said. We, we have no choice. We just sin. That's what the natural man does. But when that Spirit is interjected, what is liberty? It's the right to choose. It's the ability to make choices. It's freedom. We can choose to do right, or we can choose to do wrong. The man that's a slave to sin doesn't have that, but we in Jesus Christ have that. How can we continue to put ourselves in bondage to sin when we have the right to do right? We need every day to ask Jesus to help us, every day to walk a little more like him. And like I said, we can't be sinless, but we can sin less. And in 42, <clears throat> he says, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. And one saying that, that my wife's granddaddy says is, um, and actually uh, not Brother Stanlin, but her other, her, the one she, call, she calls granddaddy, he said one time that if you're going to let somebody borrow something, he said, don't let them borrow it. Give them what you can afford to just give them. And if they pay you back, good. If not, it'll at least keep you from being bitter. <laughs> and I, th I think that's true. And, I, and, and Jesus is saying, if somebody needs it, if we have it, he's saying don't hoard it. Be generous with your stuff. Be generous with your things because everything we have, like over there where James talked about the man, I'm going to go into town, I'm going to make a profit and all that. And, and it's like, that's all wicked. God blessed you to have whatever it is you got. And everything we have is to be used in his service. That's what revolutionizes the world when Christianity is lived like Christianity was meant to be lived by Christians. That's what changes things. <clears throat> and if you'll turn over to Philippians 2, I'll show you an example, or actually Paul will show you an example, and hopefully the Holy Spirit, of someone who had it but did not hoard it. 
Philippians 2. Now, we would all agree that Jesus, at home with his Father, from all eternity past, all the riches of heaven are his. He's the Son of God. He did not have to come down to this earth. He didn't. He could have hoarded his, the, what he had and stayed up there, and every one of us could have went to hell. But Jesus did not do that. He had it, but he didn't hoard it. In Philippians 2 and 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So there's the beckoning to the Christians again. <laughs> I'm telling you, we have a tough act to follow, and the Christian life is not just hard, it's impossible, except for the fact that we have the Holy Spirit living in us. God did not leave us comfortless. He sent us another comforter. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, being God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Another way you could render that is he emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant, a slave, basically, and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. You see, when we think about what kind of savior we have, that ought to inspire us to be like him. Because what he did and the life he lived, 2,000 years later, he's still the central figure of humanity. He's still the central figure of everything that we have. As Christians, everything that we will have in eternity is by this one man, Jesus, who was willing not to hoard what he had, but to give everything abundantly to us because he loves us. And in closing... I, I was reading a, a, a book. It, it's it's called "I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist," and uh, it's just it's a Christian apologetics thing. But there's one part in there that I thought was really good. It was a portion of a sermon, and I don't know what denomination the guy was. I really don't know. It didn't really get into that. It was just a portion of a sermon, and I thought it was very, very powerful. It says, <clears throat> "He was born in obscurity, the child of a peasant." He grew up working as a carpenter until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home or had a family. He didn't go to college. He never lived in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through a mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothes. And they were the only property he had. When he was dead... He was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. 2,000 years have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. I'm well within the mark when I say that of all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. And what was that one solitary life? What did it consist of? It consists of absolute submission to his father and absolute, absolute submission to his will, which was to give everything for me and you. I thank you for your good attention. And I would just exhort you that as you live your daily life, try to be in the Word, because the Word is what feeds us. If I didn't have the Word of God to lean on every day, I would have nothing. If anybody here has felt God stirring on you, and perhaps you've never confessed Christ publicly, He deserves your confession 
But more than that, he deserves you to live for him. He, 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 he deserves everything we got and more. And we can never pay. What did Paul say? We can never pay the debt of love. But we are bound to try it every day of our lives. And so um, I want to say that the doors of the church are open for the reception of members. If anybody would like to come up and confess Christ publicly as we sing a song, do you have one?